you see the growth of the human intellect over evolutionary spans of time is a kind of conquest of dimensionality. And the conquest of dimensionality that gave us agriculture unfortunately gave us male dominance and patriarchy. And the reason for this is uh, not far to seek. A new intellectual horizon of cause and effect was being explored. Women, who were the gatherers in the hunter-gatherer equation, were realizing for the first time the causal relationship that exists between burying a half-eaten meal over here and coming back a year later on your annual nomadic peregrination and discovering food plants growing where you buried your uneaten meal of a year ago. In other words, women came to understand the relationship between the act of planting and the appearance of usable food plants sometime later. At the same time that this was going on, men were making the connection between the fact that the sex act had something to do with the fact that nine months later women would, a woman would bear a child. And in a way, this was the beginning of the straight lockstep march into hell. <laughs> because, because once men had this notion of male paternity, male paternity, it became more important to know who your children were than it was to participate in the orgiastic, group-minded bonding that had previously occurred. And once you have the notion of my child, my child, then it moves naturally to my woman, my weapons, my food, my hunting ground, my everything. The recognition of male paternity gave permission for the growth of ego. And ego, and this, is, this was all a continuous thought, those of you who doubted, uh, this was all a continuous thought. Ego is our problem. And we always had it when we were squirrel monkeys, howler monkeys, proboscis monkeys, and all that. We only lost it in that very brief window of opportunity, maybe 20, maybe 30, 40,000 years long, when as we evolved into the grassland, we included in our diet essentially a drug which corrected our primate nature. A drug which suppressed the expression of male dominance. A drug which promoted an orgiastic sexual style that promoted group values. Because you see, and this is the point to my mind about psychedelics, what they do, not you know, my trip or your trip, which we could spend hours trading stories about, but, but when you try and talk about what is, what is the, the effect of the psychedelic experience, not one or two of them, but a hundred thousand of them, what, what generalizations can we make? The generalization that I have found most powerful is psychedel the psychedelic experience dissolves boundaries. That's what it does. And boundaries are what chain, diminish, define, and degrade us. And we are always creating them, and we are always struggling with dissolving them. And the ultimate boundary is this belief in the sanctity of the ego versus everything else in the cosmos. And I, don't be I believe that, this, uh, that the ego arose in a context of language, culture, religion, and so forth, simply because 
we evolved in the African grassland and the climate itself underwent changes that eventually placed the mushroom out of reach. And this is why the fall into history. This is what that Genesis story about the, uh, that I call history's first drug bust. This is what it's about. I mean, isn't it a little peculiar that the Ur myth of our culture opens with a drug bust? It's the story of a woman, right, those bad women, a woman who corrupts her roommate and then they both get kicked out and the lead, they break the lease essentially and they both get kicked out and where they get kicked out of is into history and I believe that the Genesis story definitely told and created at a time when patriarchy was on a roll is a memory of this break with this orgiastic goddess centered nomadic, cattle-oriented, mushroom-using uh, uh, form of human pastoralism. Now, notice in this scenario that there are no villains per se. The planet began to get dry, and that's what broke up this arboreal, papaya-oriented paradise in the treetops where everybody was male-dominated and mindless as a tomato, but having a good time, the drying of the African continent broke that party up, created a mixed ecology of, of forest and grassland, into which the primates then evolved this fascinating relationship with the cattle. You see, and I th and uh, much of what I say here is orthodox evolutionary theory. It's just the part about psilocybin that nobody else will touch with a ten foot <laughs> pole. But uh, it, moving out into the grassland, testing foods, accepting psilocybin into the diet, and then creating. Uh, based on the interruption of the natural, natural tendency toward male dominance, it was fixed 50,000 years ago. A pharmacological intervention on the entire species created then a situation of partnership. The women were the gatherers, the men were the hunters. This had to do with um, promotion of different body types that had already take, was already well established in these primates. I mean, you get this throughout the primates, the large male, barrel-chested, the more diminutive female, and the females more, largely more social than the male. The males hunt. The, uh, and in the proto-hominid situation, this was certainly true. And hunting, as you know, if you've ever done it, places a great premium on stoic waiting. That's the hunter's job, is to keep, sit down and keep your mouth shut and watch silently until it's time to make your move and then move ruthlessly without question you know, with attention. Women had a completely different set of pressures and constraints on them. As gatherers, it was uh, very important for women to be able to communicate extraordinarily subtle uh, aspects of the material world to each other. So that a woman needs to be able to say when she comes into camp with the apron full of nuts, uh, I got these near the waterfall by the bush with the small yellow leaves with the waxy flowers and the red berries that has the dry grass underneath it. In other words, for a gatherer, there is tremendous premium put on being able to describe your environment. You must be able to communicate because a woman who makes a food find 
can only bring back to camp as much food as she can carry. But if she can communicate to her sisters what is going on, then no problem. So language, I believe, largely evolved as a prerogative of women. And this stoic stoicism and uh, 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 ability to uh, tolerate uncomfortable conditions was evolved by uh, men. All of this, I think, would have been fine. It could have gone on for millions of years in this climaxed situation. The orgies were lunar, meaning they probably occurred every two weeks or at most every 28 days. That means every 28 days, every member of this society was completely dissolving any psychic structures that may have arisen in the previous 28 days. And then everybody was sitting on each other's bones in a big heap. And you can imagine the boundary dissolving impact that something like that uh, would have. Why then, if it was so wonderful, didn't we just stick with it? Why the descent into, you know, the hell of Pee Wee Herman and Richard Nixon and all of the, this stuff? Well, the same culprit that created that happy story destroyed that happy scenario. And that is the continued drying up of the planet. And that's what we get in that Genesis story. Remember at the end of the Genesis story it says, uh, and God set an angel at the eastern gate of Eden with a flaming sword so that Adam and his children could not find their way back into paradise. That's the memory of the Saharan sun scorching off the African veldt and forcing those mushroom-using pastoralists to settle in the Nile Valley and set up permanent uh, settlements and begin thinking about kingship, large-scale <laughs> agricultural projects, and so forth and so on. Uh, and what happened, it was not as simple as that may have made it seem, you see. Um, th this is really the theme of this book that I wrote for Bantam, is the theme that cultures wear drugs like clothing, and they're never aware of it. They just feel naked without their particular drug. And, and the clothing may differ. You know, one culture feels fully dressed in penis sheaths and war paint. Another culture isn't fully dressed unless the gown is by Dior. So there are different uh, styles of clothing and there are different styles of mental clothing in the form of drugs. And these drugs promote different kinds of cultural values. And what happened in this African situation was a tragedy that in a way we have seen enacted in microcosm in our own society. It was that at a certain point everything was perfect. The monthly orgies, the suppression of ego, the group values, the, uh, in, the recent invention of language was making food gathering easy for women. Uh, the abundant game was making hunting easy for men, so forth and so on. But this drying of the African continent didn't halt there. It continued. And pretty soon there were problems. Less game, less to be gathered. And most important for my theory, fewer mushrooms. And when there became fewer mushrooms, then uh, there were two possibilities. You could have your mushroom um, orgies less frequently, or you could create some kind of technology for preserving the mushrooms so that when you found a lot of them, you could save some of them for dry spells, literally for dry spells. Uh, now, the problem with this strategy is that in a world without refrigeration, the uh, 
strategy which Aboriginal people in Australia, in the Amazon basin, the strategy which Aboriginal people tend toward when they want to preserve some delicate food is they invariably go for honey. Honey. This is why some of you may know that the Romans ate uh, hummingbirds' tongues pickled in honey. It isn't because honey was the preferred medium for pickling hummingbirds' tongues. It was because that's a way of preserving delicate food. The problem with honey is honey itself can ferment into a psychoactive compound. Honey changes into mead. Mead is a form of crude alcohol. The impact on a goddess-worshipping, orgiastic, non-hierarchical, non-male dominant culture of switching over to, an al to the use of alcohol is absolutely devastating. In the same way that I told you what psilocybin did, improves visual acuity, promotes sexual activity, delivers a religious experience, we can talk about what alcohol does. It lowers sensitivity to social cueing at the same time that it gives an empowered sense of ego. In other words, it makes you into a jerk. <laughs> It, 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 it gives you the courage to say and do what, if you are a decent person, you would otherwise never say and never do. It turns each one of us into a Clarence Thomas. This is not what's needed. Boo, yes, no, who knows? Who is Clarence Thomas anyway? <laughs> And time and time again in human history, these kinds of synergies have been enacted. Well, uh, I want to say more about it. That isn't the whole story. That could be the whole story. I mean, there's enough in that for it to be the whole story. In other words, if it's true that the mushroom... Uh, you know, suppresses uh, male dominance, if it in fact promotes communal values and so forth, then what a wonderful thing it must be. And we can leave it there. But that's only a small part of the story. The real story is what is so wonderful about it? Since it's a mental experience, what is so wonderful about it that it could halt the human tendency to devolve into these counterproductive forms and lifestyles. Well, what is so great about it is that it is nothing less than half of the intellectual universe. It is uh, what I call the connection to the Gaian mind. In other words, To this point, what I've said is, could be imputed to be just talk about a superb psychedelic drug. And so they're saying, oh, well, so this guy advocates the use of a superb psychedelic drug. It seems reasonable or unreasonable, depending on where you went to church. But it, it's not that paradigm challenging. Uh, but what is paradigm challenging is the content of the experience. The content of the experience is completely uh, mind-boggling, completely befuddling. I don't know what we're going to do with the content of the experience because fully gotten out and fully discussed and fully realized it's not going to leave one brick upon another in the cheerfully naive edifice that our half-baked civilization has erected as universal truth. We're not going to, it's not, science is not going to be able to survive 
the encounter with the psychedelic experience. Because it is not an encounter with the Freudian, you know, the repressed memories of your miserable and battered childhood or whatever it is you went through. And it isn't even an encounter with the miserable memories of the battered childhood of the human species that we all went through, a la Carl Jung. Uh, what, that is all there. But that's in the hallway where you hang your hat and the antechamber where they take your coat. The main event, folks, doesn't even have anything to do with the psychology of human beings. The main event is another dimension. A dimension so bizarre, so titanically peculiar, so strange, so unanticipated by our language, our history, our literature, that uh, it is literally like the discovery of another world. And, and, uh, and there's life in that world. Now, a funny thing about discovering new worlds is that uh, you usually, when you get the new world all mapped out, you usually discover that there's somebody living there. And for them, it's not the new world at all. And, you know, you haven't discovered anything. You've just shown up in the middle of their scene uh, <laughs> with a distorted rap, sort of like Christopher Columbus. And th 